Hello. Welcome. Welcome. So in the previous episode, we extracted out the CPU and we converted to using block RAM for our program memory and our data memory. So this now runs in an FPGA. I haven't yet tested that, but it should run. It converts to Verilog, no problem. So in this episode, I'd like to do a few simplifications and improvements. So one of the issues is in the control logic here, we've got an extra bit for our instructions, but there's really only four instructions that go into that class. It sure would be nice to stick to just an opcode and that's it. So then we only have 32 instructions and that's it total. One of the things that that would reduce is this extra bit here. And also in here, we could get rid of this down here. So we'd only have um, 32 maximum instructions. And also I named this processor RJ32 thinking it would be a 32-bit processor. So there's gotta be a reason for the 32. And I think having exactly 32 instructions kind of makes sense. So then I can say, well, it's named after 32 instructions. I don't know why I'm so resistant of changing the name, but I already have a processor that I built that was RJ16. So, um, yeah. So we have the current instruction set, and I've been doing a lot of thinking about what we could change. One of the things that I'm thinking is not entirely necessary is having byte load store have this instruction format. Most of the time when you're dealing with bytes, you're dealing with strings, right? Text. So almost always you'll be dealing with a pointer to that string. So it almost doesn't make sense to dedicate uh, instruction encoding space for byte load store here. Now that does mean that if you have a byte that's stored on the stack, it's going to be a bit more expensive to access that byte, but I think that's okay. So yeah, I think that'll be okay. And if we really wanted to, what we could do is make the im instruction allowed with byte load and store, and then that way we can more easily access the stack with bytes, but it, it would just be two instructions instead of one. And it's a more rare operation unless you're dealing with code that uses a lot of bytes. But I mean, if you know that it's less efficient, you just use 16-bit words instead. So that's one optimization we could make, and then that frees up a bunch of encoding formats. Since these three bits here are what encodes the format, we get a lot more of them if we make that change. So that's one idea I had. The other thing that I don't really like is having the no ops take this much encoding space. It just kind of, I don't know, it just rubs me the wrong way. I don't know why. So it would be kind of nice to move the immediate instruction somewhere else. And yeah, it would be kind of nice to be able to expand the number of immediate bits from five to maybe six. That would be nice. And actually for some operations, it would be really nice to have even more. The other observation I made was in this instruction set, we have, I think, five different instructions dedicated to testing conditions. So we have an equal, we have a less than, greater than or equal, and then we have the unsigned variance of the less than and greater than or equal. And it would be nice to condense that down. And it would be nice actually to make uh, any instruction conditional somehow, so we could have a conditional move. So I've been doing a lot of thinking about that, and actually it makes sense to have like a, a skip functionality rather than a conditional branch. So this is what I've come up with here. Uh, this is the detailed version. So there's a simplified version and these, this is just the formats that we have. So there's um, seven different instruction formats in this new version. So it's a bit more complicated, but it's not a lot more complicated. It's just a few more formats that would need to be decoded. So compared with the old, uh, and there's some redundancy in here, but compared with the old, it's not that much more complicated when you just look at the simplified version. The Detailed version here though breaks down all of the instructions that we'll be supporting. So in this version, there's only a load and store of words that take this instruction format up here. The other thing that I did was I actually removed 
jump entirely. And I think what we can do instead of jumping is just have the program counter be a separate register. So let's say register 15 is, is actually the program counter. And if you add to register 15, then that's like a jump. So you can add an immediate to register 15 and that will jump. And if you move a register into register 15, that will also jump, but it'll jump to the location of whatever the register is. So that's one way to get rid of a couple of instructions. So then all we need is the jump in link, which is like a jump subroutine, or sometimes it's called call. So it'd be calling a function. Uh, so you have an immediate instruction that can now take 12 bits, and that can be used to extend the immediate of any of the other instructions. And then you have jal, which will call a function. And then I have a series of conditional skips, and I've named the instruction if. So you can do if equal, it will skip the next instruction. If not equal, it'll skip the next instruction. If less than, it'll skip the next instruction. There's also two versions of this instruction. One version takes a carry bit in for the comparison. So then you can compare to 32-bit numbers, for example, quite easily. Uh, and then the uh, other version, the plain version, doesn't take a carry bit. So the if instructions remove the need for a conditional move, for example. They remove the need for conditional branches because you just do an if and then skip over the branch. And you then can make pretty much anything conditional. So you could have a conditional add, for example, where you only add if a certain condition is true. And that can be used to make some things a bit faster and avoid a branch in those cases, since branches take, well, two or three instruction cycles. Right now they take two, but I have ideas that might make them take three. So yeah, and then you have your shift operations, and I have ideas for making these a little bit simpler to build so that we can build them in a discrete implementation. And you'll notice that they, these take uh, six bit immediate now, which is nice. Um, the shift operation only takes four of these six bits. So yeah, potentially there's two extra bits here that could be used for something else. Um, there's an extra bit here that's not used that could be used to do something. I'm not sure what. We have our other ALU functions. Add C and sub C now don't take an immediate or they can't take an immediate. So they're the rare ALU function that can't. I can't imagine a situation where it would be useful for them to take an immediate since they're mainly for adding 32 or 64 bit numbers together or subtracting for that matter. So that's that. And then we have our not break and break might be renamed error uh, because now we have a conditional skip, which means we should skip an error and then halt. And that's how we would do our test cases. So I think that is everything that I wanted to cover in here. So what I was thinking was I just spent three episodes working on the previous instruction set architecture. I don't think you guys want to watch me do that again. I think I'm just going to do it off camera. I hope that's okay. So I will see you in a bit after I've made those changes. So yeah, that took a bit longer than I expected, about three hours later. Um, so the tests all pass and I've hacked a few things in order to make that work. It's not implemented exactly the way that I want it to, but at least all of the tests pass. So that gives me a good stopping point. The Fibonacci program runs again and nothing seems broken. So that's good. We can see our Fibonacci numbers coming through here. So let's dive into what I changed. First things first, I removed the system bit. So there's no longer a system bit. It's replaced with a condition bit. And I was hoping it would simplify this circuit a little bit, but, um, and it has, it's a little bit simpler. Up here, only a couple of digits of the opcode get overridden by the condition code. There's a, detection of the condition 
instruction here and these will be filled out with all of the different conditions that exist. I've rearranged, of course, where the instructions are in, in this set. Uh, NOP and HALT are up here now. And the ALU instructions didn't have to move, not yet anyway. And I've temporarily put the branch of true and branch of false here. And I've put the jump here. And then load and store are the last two instructions. So that's the changes that were made in here. Overall, fairly minimal. And in here, the condition bit is taken directly from the decoder and it goes directly into the execute unit. But of course, currently that does nothing. It's just ignored because the equals instruction is still an ALU op. So those are the changes there. The system bit is gone. And in here, uh, first let's look th through here. So in here, we've got it checking the various different formats here. And not all of these tunnels are actually used for anything. Uh, it's mainly just used down here for RS valid, RD valid, and invalid. I left this uh, with all of the different formats broken out, mainly for documentation purposes. And instead of sending the mem bit from the execute unit, I just have it coming from the format. This might need to be reverted as a change, but for now, that's what I've done. And of course, this has changed to take in the prefixes on the opcode for all of the different formats. And of course, the when the format is zero, the opcode goes directly into the output. This is kind of simplified a little bit in that there's not three different parts in the instruction that encode the opcode. There's just a single op zero field because it needs to be different from the output. And then these splitters just split off a different number of bits from this op zero field in the instruction. Most of them take just the last bit. And then one of them takes the last three bits. And then this one takes all five. So that's what's changed in here. It's actually in some ways simpler because there's less of this kind of logic. In here, the immediates become more complicated, but not a whole lot. So there's a multiplexer that comes directly from the format bits and it selects which immediate is active for that instruction. So the immediate bits, of course, come from the instruction itself, and they're assigned extended most of them, except for this one, which is zero extended. And depending on the format code, a different immediate is selected. So of course, there's a couple of format codes that don't take immediates at all, so those just have zeros there. And then, in the case of a memory instruction, then the immediate goes out on the L bus. Otherwise, it goes out on the R bus if the immediate is valid. There's, of course, more test cases for all of the different formats. So these just are more of the same, where some instruction bits are put in and it just verifies that they're decoded properly. I believe this was simplified a little bit. and. Yeah, there's just more different fields within the instructions, so this is a little bit longer. Otherwise, I think this circuit seems a bit simpler in some ways, other than extra complication here, but this actually turned out not too bad. So that's the decoder. And then, of course, in the control logic, the test cases had to be updated, and some of these AND gates got a few more inputs so that it can recognize the instruction. Halt is probably the most complicated one because it's got to detect a very specific pattern and it's got to detect all five bits. Memory access only needs to detect four of those bits and the same with most of the other instructions. ALU ops only have to detect the top two bits and the system bit is no longer needed, so this has been simplified a little bit. And for now, what I did was the branch instructions are in this opcode space. So instead of move and add, it's branch of true and branch of false. And I put the jump where the JAL will be. So now 
this instruction here will be a jump. And I've just done that temporarily until we implement the skip instructions. And the other thing that we need to implement is making the program counter a full-fledged register. So in order to have a jump in this version of the instruction set, we need the program counter to be a selectable register, and then we can just move or add to it, and that will cause a jump. So those are the two changes that will be coming up fairly shortly. And I believe that's everything. Yeah, it all works. All of the test cases, all of the test programs all run again. So I hope it's okay if this was just a talky episode where I talk about the changes that I made and, and show them. I'm not sure if I want to continue doing this format, but I think it makes sense for any like cleanup or refactor episodes because um, even during editing, I don't want to watch those. <laughs> they are boring. <laughs> so I hope you don't mind if I just skip that. If you really want to see it, I did record it and I can put the footage up as an unlisted YouTube video that would be linked in the description. So if you really, really want to see me rework the processor and you don't find that incredibly boring, then I can put that footage up. It doesn't have any audio or anything, so um, it'd just be watching me in high speed rework the processor. But yeah, just let me know in the comments if you want to see that. So yeah, thank you very much for watching. I hope you have a great day. Bye.